Hey guys, Peter Overzet here. I had my best DFS season ever in 2020. I'm up over $15,000 across all my single entry and three max contests this year. And I want to tell you guys about how I was able to turn around my horrible, horrible DFS play as of about March of this year. And I attribute it to talking to really smart people, looking at the right things, studying the right things. And a lot of this stemmed from my guests that I had on my Friday shows this year. Every Friday, I would bring on one of the top DFS minds, GPP minds, and pick their brains about their process, their tips, their tricks. And hopefully you guys have been catching those throughout the season on Fridays. But if you haven't, today I have compiled the top 10 tips and tricks from these top DFS pros and put them into a single video. Okay, this is the equivalent of the Spark Notes in high school. You don't necessarily have to go read the whole book. You can get the goods here, though I have a feeling after you see some of these clips, you're going to want to go back, re-watch the full videos. I'll link to them down below. But yes, I wanted to pull these all together so we have them in one spot and we can go back and reference these. These are extremely evergreen pieces of advice. They are going to apply just as much next year as they do right now. It's not about slate-specific stuff. These are the core building building blocks that help us become better DFS players. And before we start going through the clips, I do just want to give a thank you to a few of the people from the Deposit Kingdom Discord who helped me pull these timestamps together. We got Eric Belair, Seth, Ben, Mario, Chase, Clay, Robin, and Silas. They went through, helped me grab the timestamps from some of the best moments. So thank you to the, you guys. I really appreciate it. So, Without further ado, let's get to it. These are the top 10 secrets, tips, and tricks from top DFS pros that I learned this year. See, here's, here's what I like to do. I like to sign up for the big contest one throughout the week, one day at a time. So uh, I go to DraftKings, and the first thing I do in the morning, I go to my rewards. I click on my missions. I get my extra dollar in credit right there and then uh, on my daily rewards. And then I go to my missions and I start my mission. If my mission is a high dollar, I, I don't want to sign up for all my high dollar stuff early. I need to do it one at a time so I can get all my missions behind Luke, me. That, see, that's a good hack. That's a good hack. And another just notch in the belt for Chop being a hand builder every day, putting on his hard hat, logging into DraftKings and doing his missions, collecting those crowns. New York Values here in the chat. He's asking about some good principles for contest selection. He he likes the spy and that stuff, but it's out of his bankroll. So I'm looking for some other contests with similar traits. So I thought we could head to the DraftKings lobby and let's say let's say if we had you know uh, I don't know let's say less than fifty bucks, how we would go about identifying some contests that have similar. Um, structures to the things we like to play at maybe a slightly higher buy-in here. And, and maybe we could talk it through for people. The one thing you can do on the app is you can put the, you can query for single entry in three max. And the nice thing, I have the Roto-Grinders Chrome extension up so we can see what the rake is. That's what the margin there is in yellow. And then it also shows overlay. That doesn't really come into play. And then the other thing I'll mention, Leone, is for most of these contests, they will have a bigger one. And then once that fills on like Saturday night or Sunday, they'll release another one that's smaller. And that sometimes can be nice if you're like, hey, I don't want to play in a 2000 person contest. Wait for the Sunday one and you might be able to get it in at like a 750 size contest. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I'll mention too, you know, we're looking at kind of the featured tournaments. If you look at the non-featured ones and you do the ones that just say, you know, NFL $5 contest. They have those with 118 people, 230 people, and you're not going to win a whole ton, but like that helps you level up your bankroll. And that's something we did with tilt space. I mean, the bankroll was higher to start, but if you're more likely to win these small field tournaments, then once you do that, you can move your stakes up a little bit and stay in a small field tournament. And then you're more likely to win again than if you're, you're kind of reaching for this bank. So I think... A lot of times people think, well, I'm just in it to win a ton of money and they don't realize, well, one way you could win a ton of money is yeah, banking a really large field tournament. Another way is to compete in a tournament like once every few weeks and slowly level up the stakes that you're playing. 
I think you might have to eat like we're playing in a lot of 200 man fields. You might have to eat more like a 600 man field to kind of realize your upside a little bit more. There's that chop block and that's 50 bucks, but that's a good like type of thing. Um, what do you think about that? Are you, we generally like if we can find one with a two X min cash, right? I actually don't care about the min cash. I care uh, about true. The top 10. true. I, Cause the way we're playing ideally is we want to be able to compete to win when things go right. So I like the top 10 to be flat because I, if I have a top 10 performance, I want to be rewarded for that. I don't want to get absolutely killed if I come in fourth instead of first. Um, but as far as the min cash stuff, you know, if your bankroll management is smart and you're not relying on that to play again the next week, I don't, I think that is like some, sometimes a little bit noisy as far as how much you should really take that into account. But what I like to do too, is even if I'm playing in say a bigger single entry, like the fair catch or whatever, I might try to find a 200 person tournament to toss it in as well. And just kind of smooth out the variance of like, I might brick this one, but I might sneak in a min cash in a 200 person field. Yeah. You'd be surprised how often too you make more money in the smaller field than you do in the bigger field. Sometimes even when the smaller fields, a lower entry fee and you make more money than you do in a bigger field at a bigger entry fee because of how now obviously you're giving up some huge bank potential. And the other thing too, with those like regular contests, my inclination, I don't know for sure, but my inclination is people are really playing dumping cash games into those contests, which if you're playing the tournament correctly, that should boost your ROI. I've just always had way more success in my personal belief. You know, unless you're really good at MME, you know, there's a lot of people that are people that work here, people elsewhere. Um, unless you're really good at it, I think it's by far the most advantageous thing to do to get into the, the smallest fields that you can. You know, it's not quite yeah. as sexy, I guess, if, you're, if your bankroll isn't that. But I, I also believe that that's the quickest way to build your bankroll. That's how I built my bankroll. I, I wasn't, I didn't start out three years ago or four years ago or whatever playing in the luxury box, but I started out grinding. $50, $100, as small field as I could. And you string together a couple of good wins and then you you get lucky once, you know, I you get, I think I, my first one was baseball. Got lucky once and now I have a little bit of a bankroll. And, and when do you, do you build your lineups early in the week and then uh, tweak them? Or do you wait like after an actives and now with a fresh perspective, I'm going to build those? After an actives is where I get the was that's when the magic happens, man. Like, and every week I tell myself I need to do this a little earlier because I'm cutting it too close. I'm cutting it too close. And every week I do the same thing. My last submit is like with like 45 seconds left on the DK timer before kickoff. It's always way too close to where if there's even one problem, I'm I'm in big trouble. But I always wait too late because I want to see the I hate building things and then having to delete it because I feel like Am I deleting the million dollar winner right here <laughs> only because I didn't get all the information? I, I, this may be the big one and I'm deleting it. I hate deleting lineups, so I just don't build them until I, until I get all my information in front of me. Yeah, and this is like more, I think, even psychological than anything. But last year I would do stuff where I would make like a bunch of lineups and I would just like save them, you know, on my DraftKings page. But you get anchored to those plays. It's like the same thing when you draft a guy in a fantasy league and then someone offers you a trade. You're like, no way. I just drafted this guy. I love this, dude. Uh, so I do. It's like a fine line between messing with builds, seeing what stuff fits, what stacks you like but not getting anchored to a specific construction because then stuff happens on Sunday morning and you need that fresh perspective. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's a, it's a mental thing. Single, single entry tournaments have more condensed ownership. It's easier to find leverage. That's what I mean by being contrarian in single entry. Doesn't mean the whole lineup is contrarian, but you could someone that's going to be, uh, 25% owned in 150 max, maybe 38% owned. We saw Miles Sanders last week. Like the ownership nearly doubles, which means that if you fade that guy and that guy busts, you like bust like more, more than half the lineups in the, in the contest. So if you just fade that guy and then play the best plays, you're probably in good shape. Or if you eat that chalk, you're going to have to get much different in all the other spots. So the main difference between six, like three max, you get a little bit, a little bit more contrarian. Because people have three entries. It, it, you're exploiting the fact that people think in terms of, I only have one entry, I have to play safer. 
I think in terms of I only have one entry, I have to because they're playing safer, I'm going to play a little bit more riskier because over the course of a 17 week season, I just have to bink once. If I come in last place 16 times, that's who that's not that's not what I'm playing for. And in a 150 max tournament, people tend to play more risky because they have they have more lineups or whatever. So the ownership isn't as condensed. So you have to basically take that into account more. Not I hate people that say I I, I got one lineup. I can't I I can't play Gabriel Davis because I only got one lineup. It's like, well, he's does he fit that lineup for that contest? Yeah, then play him. Oh, well, I have 20 lineups, which means I could take shots on like guys that are going to see like three snaps. I'm like, that's stupid also. So just because you have 20 lineups, just build build a good lineup and then build another good lineup and then another good lineup. And then if you if, if you could build 100, great. If you could only build 20, great. If you could only build five, great. It doesn't really matter. Like I only, I'm putting in, I'm putting in $15 worth of entries, Pete. If I don't get at least 12 back, I'm broke. Like then you shouldn't be playing. How are you think? Because uh, you mentioned the DAC ownership, the Mahomes ownership. That was one of those things where if you didn't have your finger on the pulse of kind of water cooler chatter and updated ownership projections, you might not have noticed the steam on Mahomes and DAC suppressing. How are you thinking about this? Because to me, it's such a mind fuck in that there's this. Uh, self-fulfilling prophecy element to ownership once everyone talks at the beginning of the week yeah, how Dak's yeah. great and then all of us contrarian guys come in later in the week and say you can't play them and then it swings back how much are you monitoring conversational chatter like this to help dictate what might actually now be a good play well that's a big reason why i decided to add this show on establish a run on sunday mornings because i was just doing the friday show and that's great there's plenty of information and stuff to go on by friday but over the weekend i felt talking to people and building lineups, I just got a better feel for, for some things that maybe were different from the projections or ownership or whatever. And Leone, and Leone did it with me. He's going to continue to do it with me, the, the Sunday morning show. And we were talking last Sunday and we we're both talking about how good of a play Mahomes was in tournaments. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, everyone's saying this throughout the course of the weekend. I think Mahomes actually is going to be owned here. It just makes too much sense. He ended up being the highest owned quarterback in the 3K. So I think that stuff applies maybe a little bit more to the higher stake stuff. Um, but things do shift as you get closer to game time. And so I think it's nice to have that update Sunday morning. But I, I think it, it has become a little different where we do need to think about the fact that the field isn't, you know, chasing, they're not chasing game logs, really. It happens a little, but n nowhere near to the extent of three, four years ago. And everybody is aware, you know, these, Oh, buy low, guys! Like you're not actually really buying low in DFS. No. Maybe in maybe in season long, you you end up buying high. So there ends up being more of an advantage. It's so ass backwards now. There ends up being more of an advantage to seeing if there this really is like a trend of this guy. You know, not not really being what we thought he was. It's and it's not a buy low. Um, so it, it, you know, it's it's totally been a you know whirlwind change for me because that was something that I, you know, was able to take advantage of that I'm that I'm like galaxy braining myself into, you know, DJ Moore last week. And maybe DJ Moore again <laughs> again again this week. Everybody was buying low on DJ Moore. And maybe we don't want to buy low on DJ yeah. Moore. One thing you could do is look at uh sometimes there'll be like really cheap stacks that people are on for whatever reason. Um, in addition to them being cheap and they're not, they're like sort of suboptimal plays and maybe you play the defense against them um, because you're getting it. Obviously you have 20% of people in a field, they have the stack, uh, the stack does poorly, they're dropping. Um, and then on top of that, you have the defense, they have a pick six or something like that. And then you're rising. So you get yeah. that, that double benefit. I guess an example of that, I haven't ever thought of it, but I like that idea. Like, so this week you have Joe Burrow's really cheap at 5,500. People are kind of down on Cleveland. They're at home. You can stack him cheaply with uh, Higgins, with Boyd. And maybe to your thought in that extension would be like, hey, maybe play the Cleveland defense there. And um, and you get kind of a double whammy of a low owned defense and lapping some of a chalk stack. Yeah, that, that's a perfect example, actually. When you have a really, really cheap... Uh running back that is a borderline play, but everyone's going to play him because he's so cheap that then, then uh, yeah, if the defense is in a good spot, no one is going to play that defense that has that running back in the lineup. Right. Yeah. 
That's so their, oh. their, their ownership is naturally deflated because of that. Yeah, that, it's going to be different each each slate. Uh, the the first thing that I'm going to do every slate, though, is identify the main leverage point on a slate, uh, which is generally the highest owned player. Um, if, you know, like last week, the, the very obvious leverage point last week was Mike Davis. Uh, that there was just, if you were starting your lineups, you either started with or without Mike Davis and you just went from there. So I think that really what we need to be looking at is how people are going to be building and that's the other spot that I'll go to if I don't have a main leverage point is a main construction or main roster construction point where if people are going to be saying, OK, there's all this value at quarterback and wide receiver, I'm just going to pay up at running back. Then maybe I'll try to go mid range at running back and then pay up at wide receiver and, and be different from the field that way, because you can still play popular plays that way. But um, if you have a different roster construction, then you're still going to be different enough and gaining enough points at different spots. Uh, that you're still going to be unique. So I, I think that most of what I want to do is find the main leverage point. And then I'll be looking at over on my tools. Um, I have some red zone splits, which show uh, red zone and touchdown expectations for teams. I usually for stacks want to try to find the teams that have the highest passing touchdown expectation um, because there is a large difference between a regular passing rate and a touchdown passing or a red zone passing rate. So I'll look for teams that have a high passing touchdown expectation, and then I'll start trying to build around those as well as um, a top finish percentage, which is another metric on my sheets that shows how often a team has the top scoring players at their individual positions. So a lot of it is just trying to not only maximize my leverage on the rest of the field, that's first and foremost, and like the most important thing that I need to build for GPPs but then also being competitive if those lineups are going to be unique because it doesn't matter if you have leverage on the field, if your lineups suck and, and if they're not going to have high enough upside to win a GPP. I want to look at projections around the industry. I don't necessarily aggregate them, but I'll go to different, different content sites yeah. and, uh, and see, you know, because the blitz by Cardi is not going to be a consensus take and no. the ownership projections may be slightly different here versus there. So I'll go around and see, it's like, Oh, okay. This guy's rejecting well these places, not as much so here, just to get a more of a sense of what the field is doing. Because I'm basing my play on what the field is doing more so than who has a good matchup and, you know, point per dollar value. Like once I make my player pool based on the what the field is going to do, I can throw the projections out the window. I mean, now I'm just building based on correlation and leverage. So the median projection doesn't really matter anymore. How do um, how do strategies change when entering single entry and three entry max tournaments? Are the build rules the same with a tight core of players, or do you want three unique lineups in three entry contests? Yeah. So, quick plug: I do. I have a video on my my YouTube about this. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but I don't have. I only have like ten strategy videos. It's one of them. Um, I think it's called like correlations or something like that. But the long uh, to to sum that up is if your EV is the same, it doesn't really matter. So, but what I would do is if the EV is the same, so let's just consider points be equals EV in 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 our world. Projected points. Projected points for for the team. I would just I, as long as they're close, I would make the teams as different as I could could, and just have three straight shots at it. Right, as long as they're within a couple points here. So, like, if we're using this sim here, obviously I take the number one. I might fade this one, although it's pretty different, right? Um, and then, so like, let's say I don't want to do Mahomes then, so then I'd probably do the Tannehill stack and then the Burrow stack. Yeah, and I, they're all about the same EV, and they're completely different. I got three shots. And let's just also call a spade a spade. It's way more fun to have three different games that you can root for, you know, yeah. that be it all in. And obviously if you hit on your one game, that's going right. to be nice for you. But like you said, if you're not sacrificing projected points in EV, like might as well let it rip in a few different spots. That just seems more fun to me. That's how I end up doing it. I've kind of had my core and then I'm cycling through the stacks around it. Yeah, it's fun until uh, uh, Devontae Adams goes off for 47 and you purposely took him out of the other two. You know, you think about it to win a to win a play action, which I think is what like two hundred thousand or something entries. You know, yeah, six six figures in entries. Um, you know, you need a ninety nine to a hundred percent of kind of the optimal total 
to win a 200 person or even a thousand or even 200, you know, 2000 person tournament, you don't really need like the 99% of the optimal or hundred percent of the optimal. You, you might, you know, someone might throw in a, a, you know, uncorrelated lineup and just hit the nuts, but like, it's pretty unlikely. What's more likely is that the winning lineup is 95% or 93% or 97% of kind of the combined optimal. And when you acknowledge that you don't need to get to 100%, you just need to get to 95% of, you know, the optimal combination of players. Now, all of a sudden you're like, all right, well, I'm less concerned about losing that upper 5%. And I'm really focused on, okay, what's going to give me the highest chance of getting to 95% of the optimal. And, you know, when you uh, reduce the number of degrees of freedom to, you know, six or seven or eight, you know, uh, like naturally you're going to give yourself a better chance. Like, I mean, let's just assume like every single player has, uh, you know, 50% chance of hitting some useful ceiling. And, I, and obviously it's not that it's, you know, 5% chance or whatever, but even if it is 50, you know, the, the, the function for the probability of you putting together a nine leg parlay that hits all of those 50%, you no, know, it's two to the power of nine. If you look at two to the power of nine compared to two to the power of seven or six, I mean, it's like exponentially lower um, likelihood, you know, to the power of nine versus like, you know, to the power of six. And then when you when you actually acknowledge that it's not a 50 percent chance, it's like a five or 10 percent chance. I mean, you're really doing yourself a favor where you are trading that upper kind of five percent of what's possible for, uh, you know, five percent in terms of, you know, your score relative to the, the true optimal. Uh, you're willing to trade that upper five percent for you know, increased likelihood of reaching that 95th percentile of kind of combined outcome. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting conversation because I think this is one of the things where we're getting like levels on levels on levels of DFS game theory over the years, because I think, you know, the last few years, it was kind of clearly established that the field just wasn't stacking enough, um, whether it was um, single stacks or double stacks, double stacks with a bring back. It just wasn't happening uh, frequently enough in GPPs. And so there was, there's an edge to be had in those. And now the pendulum is starting to swing in, in the direction of these super large field contests where perfection is, is close to what's required that you might have to start scaling back some of the stacking to try to get more of the perfection. Um, I personally am still aiming for more and more of the game stacking, even in the super large field contest, simply because I want to be able to try to, to advance without with getting fewer things right. Um, I do think in the context of really chalky games, um, you need to be a little bit more careful on that. So in the case of like Dallas Atlanta this week with Ridley and, and Julio Jones and heavier price tag players, at chalky ownership in super large field contests, I think you do need to be a little bit more careful because they start to eat into the, the ceiling, as you noted, um, together. And that might be harder when like a Millie maker where so much of the prize pool is to the, to the one spot. Um, so I still think in lower owned uh, game stacks, it makes sense to double stack. It makes sense to bring back. In higher owned ones though, I think you need to be more thoughtful, which might mean just honestly in general in some of the higher owned game stacks in Millie Maker type contests where the payout structure is so wildly tilted to first place, you might just want to avoid the high, high owned game stacks in general, even if you think they're not as owned as they should be, um, just so you can make sure that you get contrarian. Because ultimately you can, as like we've learned many years ago from a lot of Jonathan Bale's writing in the industry, you can, you can win these GPPs by being kind of anti-fragile and, and hoping that things kind of work against the field. So I think it depends a little bit on the type of stack that you're trying to build and the ownership and the price tags associated with it. But I do agree with the concept in general that smaller fields are more conducive to full game stacks because it's one less decision point that you need to get right. So how do you think about, I guess, the contextual differences of when you need to force a bring back versus when it's okay not to? Yeah, I would say that like the contextual differences is something I'm for sure taking into account when I'm hand building or hand editing a lineup is trying to think about that. Like the, yeah, like you said, the Vikings are a good example. Uh, the Titans would be another good example where they have highly efficient passing games and they can, they have high team totals, but the passing volume is likely to be low unless they get into a bad game script. Um, 
And so I, I do think that stuff matters. But I think one of the things that's just interesting is as content keeps talking about this and, you know, we've been double stacking and bringing it back for a few years now, but it's become exceedingly popular this year to the point where 50% of people in the Millie Maker were doing it and 75% of people in a higher stake stuff. So if you're in these contests filled with like DFS regs who are listening to 10 hours of content a week, like they're going to be aware of that strategy. It's, it's mandatory. Um, and I usually try to do it at this point because tight end has just been such a wasteland this year that I have really tried to use tight ends in my secondary stacks. Um, specifically guys like TJ Hawkinson or Hunter Henry or Mark Andrews or stuff like that, where they have a decent median projection and for them to actually find their ceiling, which is really rare for tight ends this year outside of Travis Kelsey, um, it's, it's going to need to be a shootout. So I have liked using tight ends in my secondary stacks, but in every single stack, I, I'm trying to have as many correlative spots as possible, just because I, I don't want to build a glorified parlay. If I, if I want to build a player parlay, I'm just going to go take touchdown props on all the players that I have in my lineups on, on Bovada or something like that. Um, just to like have a sweat, but I want as little things that need to go right for me to do well as possible. So I, I correlate as much as I can. So I'll first go into the slate and look at two things. One leverage points, like who's the chalk and what's the negative correlation off the chalk. And then the second thing would be blocks. So look at, that's why I, I'm big into vomit stacks because from a point per dollar value, if, if a team is cheap, and I could, and I don't care about the quarterback and I could get two wide receivers and a quarterback and then a run back for like reasonable price. And then I could jam in a Kamara Zeke and, you know, high price wide receiver in there. If the stack, if the stack works, the lineup wins because I have the best plays in the rest of my lineup. So I'm looking for that, not necessarily uh, like the core, like if, if in a lineup like that, I don't have a secondary correlation, then so yeah. be and in some lineups, it may just be, it won't be a double stack. It'll be a 2-1, sometimes a 2-2. Two, two. Sometimes I look for blocks. I think there's one block, one, maybe two blocks this week where you could do 3-2, two. you know, 2-2, two, 3-2. Two, two. And if that game goes off, you pretty much get like 85% of production. And then like you proved last week, you don't have to get everything right. You're playing a 4,000 person contest. Like when I, when I came in third with the lion stack, Galladay had three points. <laughs> Marvin Jones had four touchdowns, but the block as a whole won. I didn't have to care if Galladay got two touchdowns and Marvin Jones got two touchdowns. I win also. So, like, yeah. it doesn't matter where the points go to on the team. As long as it works out, it works out. I've been thinking about late swap stuff recently, and I think that's what you just described is why it kind of messes with my head in that you probably shouldn't late swap if you're more like middling and you can min cash, but it's actually if your lineup is doing well and you have access to the really top heavy prizes in the top five where it actually makes more sense to late swap. Does that, does that, yeah, it, out? it really depends, but late swap is the most um, overlooked source of EV. It's crazy. Like you have a, you have a chance at 345, whatever to redo your lineup based on how you're doing. It's almost as important as the initial lineup. And people are just like, I don't, I don't know what they're doing. They're just, you know, mostly just let it go. Um, yeah, the late swap is the biggest edge in DFS, I think. So, so far this NFL season, my strategy is to, at the one o'clock games, by the time they're over, be so, so, so far behind that I have no choice but to swap. And both times that that's happened, it so happened that I was on one Seattle receiver or I wasn't on one Seattle receiver. And the other one was going to be significantly less owned. And then I also ended up on Russell Wilson. So when you say this has been a key part of your strategy, are you saying you are per, are, are you constructing your lineup um, and specifically breaking ties to having more late game players? Obviously the pool is more limited when we only have a couple of games, but is that a consideration that's kind of even breaking ties for you when you're deciding between players? Yeah, so both of these situations, it didn't end up like that at all. The the situation played out where I was just so drastically far behind going into the late games. I had no choice but to swap drastically onto people that would be significantly lower owned. And luckily, both of those weeks where I had that option, there was plays that worked out for me in that situation. Um, but that is the tiebreaker I use. Uh, in all sports, if I have a situation where I'm like 
right between two guys or like right between a 2v2 or 3v3 or whatever, I will prioritize flexibility as a tiebreaker because flexibility can be incredibly important. Uh, as I've seen twice this year, I, I went from what my original line would have been both weeks to literally losing 100% both weeks to smashing and being a top 5% line at both weeks. So like for me, I think I ended up making like 30 to 40 grand those two weeks compared to what I would have made on my original lineup just because I had that flexibility available. And when you're making those late swap decisions, um, are you rerunning um, uh, using an optimizer? Or are you doing that all just looking at estimated ownership projections and seeing where you can get the most leverage on chalk? It, yeah, it's generally just me looking at, at that point, like in those situations, it doesn't really matter uh, the projections per se. It matters more where I can get the leverage and where I can avoid the chalk situation. So like last week, I knew Lockett would be incredibly high owned and I knew the Garoppolo would be very high owned on drafting. So like I know I could get Russ at, let's say, 10 to 15% compared to that of Jimmy at like 30 to 40. And I know I can get Lockett at let's say, I think he was 40 to 50 compared to DK at like 10 to 12. And it's a situation where like, it wasn't only I was getting off of chalk, I was getting on to the perfect leverage guy off of them as well, both times, because I went from like, if DK has 40 points, Lockett probably is not going to produce very much. And that is obviously what happened. Like Lockett still ran pretty bad. It could have obviously had a better performance, but if DK has 40 points, there's only so many points to really accrue. You know, some weeks we talk about, you know, not just having a contrarian stack or a contrarian play, but getting off the contrarian build and the contrarian structure. And sometimes when you go down that path, you go from mega chalky to super contrarian across the board because you're so different. You're just playing guys at different salary levels, at different positions that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to look at that lineup and say, oh, it's too contrarian. I know it's, it's sort of this, a or B type thing where A is you're going with the chalk build and maybe you do one or you know, do a two V two on some guys or B you go with the non chalk build, in which case you're probably pretty low owned across the board. And I think that's okay. And we've done a good job mixing and matching that the week we won, it was contrarian stack and we were still able to fit the chalk running backs in, but there was another week, you know, I, I did well the week Aaron Jones went off and everyone played Leonard Fournette at chalk and you, that was a situation where when I got off the bill because Jones, I believe was a little bit cheaper. I, I just had like almost no chalk in that lineup whatsoever. And and someone even said to me, Hey, is that lineup? I know you won, but is it too contrarian for a small field? And I don't know. I, I just like to see how many spots I can get my lineup where I can really pick up points on the field, you know, and, and really just like, I don't think you can ever have too much leverage at a certain point. If you're, if you have really fringy plays and you have eight really fringy plays, then yeah, you've probably gone too far. But if you have eight plays that you legitimately feel good about, but maybe they project a point or so behind the top plays, I think that's fine. You can give up five to eight projected points out of you know 160 projected points if you're getting a ton of leverage out of it. Yeah. And one shift and a key shift that I made, like last year, I was the biggest donkey because I, I fancied myself as this contrarian player and whatever the, oh, I can't play Christian McCaffrey. I can't play Lamar Jackson and all of this, but I didn't have a reason for why I was fading it. And what I've now realized, so take the Dalvin Cook example from last week. I faded Dalvin Cook. Okay. So that, that turned out bad, but how I went about fading him was trying to leverage it. If Dalvin Cook doesn't succeed, maybe it's Derrick Henry who no one is playing. Who's the running back that goes off. Oh, we're going to play Justin Jefferson or Adam Thielen. Maybe they benefit if Dalvin Cook doesn't go off. So being like very purposeful and mindful with how you're leveraging it. It's not just, I'm fading this guy. Like if you're going to fade Mike Davis this week at 60%, you might need to try to tell yourself a story. How does he fail? You know, maybe that game just collapses or maybe Teddy Bridgewater, you know, is throwing two touchdowns to Robbie Anderson and DJ Moore at the goal line. You know, whatever you need to say, if you're going to make those decisions, I think you just need to, dare I say, tell yourself a story around <laughs> how that chalk fills, Joe. You need to maximize your points where other people are not getting them. So like if, if let's say uh, Miles Gaskin has 30 points, but Miles Gaskin is 98% owned, it doesn't matter what Miles Gaskin yeah. does. If you get a guy that is 2% owned, get 30 points, and everyone's playing a chalk guy that gets 15, that is incredibly important. But also similarly, like if you get a chalk, if you get a guy that like let's say you have a 20% owned guy, 
and other people have a 50% owned guy and the 20% owned guy wins by five points. That's still a huge situation where you are beating that entire subset of people by five points. So it, it's, it's all about getting points where other people do not get points and increasing your equity that way. So one thing that you've talked about a lot before, and it's actually a phrase that has stuck in my head about lots of stuff in, in life and in DFS, this idea of playing a different game, which I think speaks to being contrarian. How do you apply that concept of playing a different game than other people to DFS? And with the caveat, like everyone is getting sharper. Everyone is out leveling each other, galaxy braining to the same late swaps. How does that all fit into the field collectively getting sharper and more willing to take on risk? Yeah, it's much harder. It's much harder than it used to be. I mean, but in the early days of DFS, I think it was like just ownership. People were not, uh, you know, weighing, uh, they, they were basically just trying to pick the best plays and not um, focusing on the payoffs as much as they should. And then it turned into maybe um, the projections, like projecting a range of outcomes for for players, and you know, focusing on on probabilities rather than uh, like a mean projection type of thing. And then it became more about uh, correlations and focusing on the range of outcomes for the entire lineup. And now it's all of those things. And then, you know, uh, lineup con construction, uh, pairing certain types of players who are uncorrelated based on their ownership, um, anti-fragility uh, in general, in terms of like exploiting people's overconfidence in, in, you know, you pick like a certain play that you think is gonna be chalk and you think it's wrong for whatever reason, you know, not only do you fade that, but how do you benefit if they're wrong um, type of thing? So you, where you get a double benefit, um, but the entire time in, in tournaments, I, I think that um, the, the goal in tournaments has always been to win when you score as few points as possible. And most people think it's to score as many points as possible. So I, that has never changed. And that will always be the case. You should not be trying to score as many points as possible. You should be trying to win when you uh, don't need to score that many points.